Uh, you couldn't play five black players because uh, they were undisciplined. You couldn't play five black players because they didn't follow orders. You couldn't play five black players because they would just uh, choke when the going got tough. Every athlete's dream is to get to a playoff, not alone think about making it to the final four. Yeah, that's what he was talking about. Hey, man, you realize what y'all did? <laughs> yeah, we won. He said, no, nah, man, think about it now. Black against white. I said, right. You know, we don't, I don't even think about it until he brought it up. I mean, they talked a little in the paper, but to me it's just a game, but ended up not being just a game. Well, that was probably one of the most exciting games a broadcaster ever did because it was so spectacular and so unusual. What's that little old black school down in Texas was the attitude I heard a lot. But I think it opened eyes and paved the way for cha possible changes in attitude. This was the perfect place, the perfect environment for the incubation of, of the whole championship team and the significance later in years. My grandfather was watching this game and he called my parents after the game because he lived in East Texas and he asked if my parents were sending me to an all-black school. Well you know we were much smaller then and all the uh, all the athletic programs were a part of um, they were the center of a lot of the of the entertainment and everybody had tickets to the games. Well, the atmosphere was wonderful. There was such an air of excitement. This is a campus that, if you look at the previous year, 1965, the editor of the, of the uh, flow sheet was a guy named Nelson Sanders, who was black. Aside from that, we were a very special community. Texas was not one of the places that I, uh, that I ever had a chance to go. So, you know, of course, you know, uh, the oil wells and looking for the, the cowboys and all that stuff was my first impression. And when landing here in El Paso, I saw all the beautiful mountains and everything. And of course, landing out on the airfield where you had to walk into the airport. It was somewhat strange to me, but I felt pretty comfortable because the people right from the beginning were really friendly to me. They said El Paso, I thought they'd still be running around with, uh, you know, <laughs> horses and cows. I was, I was shocked when it was a city. I knew not a thing about Texas Western. When I first got here, it was like nothing but desert, you know, and just the mountains and stuff, you know, and I had to adjust like everybody else, I guess, you know. El Paso was huge compared to uh, uh, our, our cattle farm. <laughs> I left Detroit, it was about I had 10 degrees when I got here, it was 70. This was in January, I didn't know what I was coming in for at all. My initial impressions of this school and of the city was one of warmth, because I was treated real, real well here. Uh, slow pace, lovely people. Uh, New York City, we don't speak often to anyone, but in El Paso, I walked three steps. Howdy, how you doing? It was a very friendly town. The, 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 everybody that lived here was friendly. The, uh, the staff was friendly at the university. Um, and they had a great, great basketball program. I love the college. It was all in one area and uh, it was a beautiful campus. 
it was different you know it was a uh, you know from the architecture you know and you know the way the landscape was it was it was quite odd you know versus the big city's uh you know campus atmosphere it was no culture shock it's the same all over believe me just a black white mexican you know chinese And I think from the moment I stepped off the plane and saw El Paso, saw the mountains, uh, came and visited, met some of the, uh, the players, met with Coach Haskins and Coach Iba, I knew that this is where I wanted to end up. I played basketball at Austin High School and I had two wonderful coaches that were, you know, like, like any parent would like a coach to be, is counsel their kids, you know, and, and um, I had an academic scholarship. I knew I was going to go to college. and. Um, Texas Western just happened to be in El Paso. Uh, well, I was going to a junior college in uh, Iowa in those days. In the 60s, you only had to go one year. And uh, Coach Haskins saw me at a junior college, National Junior College Tournament. I first met Coach Haskins. I was on my way home uh, for lunch one day, and he drove past me in a car, and he followed me all the way home. My mother just fell in love with him. And my mother is the one who is what was instrumental in me getting here. She's the one who said that this is where you're going to go to school. This is where I want you to go because I think that he's a fine gentleman and that he'll help you grow. And I remember a representative from one of the banks came to New York City and I had a chance to talk to him. And I attended uh, for one year uh, North Carolina A&T and I left there and did not want to really get into the food business of working in a fast food place in uh, New York City and wanting desperately to go back to school. So after talking to him, I did not hesitate to uh, take that first decision and come into uh, El Paso. And as you see, it was the best move I ever made in my life. Uh, now I was recruited by uh, Willie Brown and uh, uh, one of the uh, vice presidents of the, of the bank came down to watch me play and a few others, and he saw you know, that I had game, I guess. <laughs> so I grew up in Albuquerque, um, first person in my family to attend college. Uh, <laughs> I think part, probably, this is silly, but uh, my father was stationed in Enid, Oklahoma for a while in World War II, flying bombers, and it turned out that that's where Coach Haskins was from. And I think it made the dialogue between he and my parents rather comfortable. The school had, had just become a liberal arts school from the Texas School of Mines, and my father was interested in my becoming an engineer, and uh, it was a good choice. Uh, we liked Coach Haskins, uh, we liked his approach to basketball, and I came. The, the way I got here was kind of funny, Dr. Joe Ray, uh, the president of the university. Uh, I've ne I guess it's the only time I've been interviewed, and he looked at me and uh, I guess I weighed about 210 or 220, and I was going to live in the in, in the the uh, miner the old miners hall, the dormitory, the athletic dorm, and the only thing he was concerned, he never asked me if I could coach. He said, "Can you run that damn dorm?" You big girl, you, you know, tell him Mo, Mo, put a go, put a skirt on him. He was kind of like uh, Jack Warren Hyde. <laughs> <laughs> he was a tough guy, and um, we were, Coach Askins and I were on the same page because I thought that I was a tough guy too. I played AAU basketball for three years uh, with uh, the Artesia Travelers who were in the National Industrial Basketball League. And uh, all of a sudden I realized that uh, wasn't gonna, I didn't want to play much longer and and didn't know what to do and I went to a coaching clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico and uh, decided that, uh, well, I didn't know anything else, maybe I uh, ought to try coaching. And my wife, Mary, that was the only thing she ever told me uh, that she was wanting me to coach. Uh, at that time, we only had uh, 
one child. And we took off for Benjamin, uh, coached girls basketball, boys basketball. I was the coach. I was the, I was the only coach. Uh, that was my first job. That's how I got introduced to uh, coaching. Uh, next year, I, I, I made a real good switch. Went to Headley, Texas, town of 500. I liked that because we didn't have football. And, you know, get to practice. But I was still driving the school bus. And I was at Headley four years and then went to the metropolis of Dumas, which is about 12,000 for one year. And then George McCarty, the guy that was trying to hire me as an assistant, by then was dean of men at Texas Western. I took a pay cut coming from Dumas, but uh, I loved it. You know, having the opportunity to uh, be a college coach is something that a lot of guys have to wait a lot longer than I did. And the only reason I got that opportunity was uh, George McCarty, so I owe a lot to him. He was the bear. I mean, he was loud, and uh, he was one thing, you know, he always had the reputation of getting after the referees. So as students, that's all we needed was that someone to help us get, you know, agitate the referees even more. So his, the way he, he moved, the way he yelled, the way he talked, just made us, you know, go up one step higher in terms of uh, wanting to agitate the referees. I had met Coach Haskins a few times when we were playing ball in high school, and uh, he was always at the high school ball games looking for talent and, and uh, promoting basketball in El Paso, and even a man with his busy college schedule had time to do that, and I kind of kind of respected that. First time I met Coach Haskins and uh, Coach Iber, they met us at the airport. It was Willie Cage and I, and this nice little punchy young gentleman, um, you know, met us at the airport. And we shook hands, and you know, he told us it was glad, you know, he was glad to um, have us here in uh, El Paso and looking forward to, you know, uh, watching us play basketball. I had the red shirt my first year, and he was. You know, he told, you know, he, I mean, he was great, you know, easy talking guy, you know, Coach Iba didn't say much. It was Coach Haskell that was doing the talking. And I said to Willie Cage, I said, I said, Willie, man, I like this coach. After practice, yes, but during practice, it, it, <laughs> it was a little bit different. He wasn't so nice doing practices. You know, he would yell, he would scream, he would get on you. Had his ways of motivating people. He wouldn't care if you're yellow, pink, purple, it doesn't matter. He just hates everybody to practice no matter what. It was super hard, I would put it that way. I think we practiced until Coach Haskins got tired. If I had to do over, we'd practice a little harder. Unbelievable. When you play for the man, you have a slightly different uh, feeling for him. But once you've graduated, you come to appreciate more and more what he does with the talent he has and how he's able to get the most out of that talent. Well, he was tough on a few guys. He wasn't tough on me because I knew you know, what I was doing. For some reason, I became Coach Haskins' whipping dog. You know, he had quite a few lovely names for me. Never cursed at me, you know, nor did he kill my spirit. And he didn't like Haskins, you know, he'd talk about your mother, you, everybody else. And say, you wild man. And when we played, uh, you got one drink of water, and that was in between half. He said, Neville Shep, sometimes if your brains were dynamite, you just blow this gym up. You know, and the guys would kind of sniggle, and I'd kind of, well, I thought he was kind of tough. I got used to it. And I just grit my mouth, you know, never would look him in the face, you know, or nor show the, the traces of anger or some of the nice words I was trying to say to him, you know, boop. He got his point across. But he had told us uh, prior to uh, practices, prior to us even signing that, he was the kind of a guy that would ride you and if he rode you, that meant that he thought that you could help him. Far none, our practices were harder than any game. We were going to the games, you know, playing the games was no comparison. The practice was tough, very difficult, but uh, I like being difficult and certainly nothing good ever happened uh, f uh, from not having good preparation. So we were, we were preparing to be a good team. It was the standard, you know, the running, you know, doing a couple of layup drills. Then we went to this four, this four corner uh, defense and that defense was but defense wins you ball games. He, he demanded, uh, I think, and expected a lot from you. What he was really doing is giving me the gut check. And he had this thing, I said, I'm gonna show you. And 
myself along with other players when he, when he went through these little uh, antics it made us play harder but just playing you know he has something new for us you know he's a smart he knew his athletes the next day was a new day he never brought anything from the previous practice into the gym the next day so you know I felt comfortable with the fact that hey I'm coming in here I don't want to hear that fat man yelling at me anymore here you know, so I'm gonna get out here and break my little at week's end we were very anxious to have a game it was the lightest night of the week we played very simple basketball uh, we didn't play zone defenses we didn't switch on defense we we played a, a straight up man to man our offense was very simple and uh, we could understand it and if we did it well enough that's how it worked and he told us this, if, if we could be calm proficient at those few things we would win oh I was always nervous uh, not about the other team I was always nervous about mine and he set us down after this one day of practice and he walked he started walking up and down and said I just can't believe you all far enough, I don't think you all will win a game the whole darn season you know you're the worst I've ever seen worst that I was a famous word you're the worst I've ever seen far enough and you know tired and I kind of looked down <laughs> at the rest of it and we looked kind of scrawny you know and I said man it's gonna be a hard season I remember calling my dad before we'd even played my first game back in Kansas and telling him we had a special team and I felt, felt that we really had a chance to do well. I knew we were going to have a good team because the year before the people we had on our freshman team uh, were beating our varsity consistently. I didn't know how far we would go but I knew we had a special team. I always thought we were going to be real good. The secret is uh, you know you never know until you play against the supposedly big teams. We weren't even ranked at the beginning of the season. We knew what we had as far as, you know, with Latin and uh, Willie Burgess and myself, you know. We knew that we had a good team. How far we were going to go, you never know that. We had the Bobby Joe Hill and Neville Shedd and, hey, had a flow and just put the pieces together and that was that. We thought we were very good. We had a team that every athlete, the personalities were all, you know, they were all different. You know, we all sang a different song. And when you put that melody, melody together, you know, it came out with a, with, with a sound that was just, you know, courageous that I guess it's, you know, it's, it, the shot came around the world. I, I knew we had good talent. I knew we were quick and uh, we played well as a team together. Uh, at the times I could get them to play. This group sometimes had a hard time staying focused uh, in ball games, and uh, they would get behind, and then they would they would play uh, to their ability uh, to come back and win ball games. We were always relaxed. We played cards all the time, you know, spade. Well, they were very difficult to motivate because we had a quiet confidence about us. Most of the guys from big cities, they weren't they weren't going to be intimidated by anybody. You need a great team to be a great team, but you also need one or two players that really stand out. As time went on, uh, Bobby Joe uh, Hill got better as, as every ball game. And of course, Latin became a force with Harry and, and Orston. Bobby Joe and I had a great relationship. The cohesiveness is just very difficult to explain that we had together. We had a great understanding. Bobby Joe Hill is as good a leader as there's ever been in basketball when you get him turned on. You need a dominant player inside, you need a dominant player outside. Certainly we were, along with our teammates, we were that one of the things that really made us very good. So it was, it was a situation where our basketball team started the year very good, but we improved as each game went along. I felt very comfortable as a big man because I had David Lappin, six foot six, two hundred and forty-four pounds. I had one of the best uh, uh, rebounders, you know, on the other side of me, and I was a pretty good, uh, you know, uh, player myself. I played all uh, three positions: guard, forward, and center. So wherever I was needed, I could handle the ball. I could you know, play the post. Uh, I can 
do some moves to, to get myself open and, and go score. We had the ability to mold ourselves to the opponent quickly. And it was Coach Haskins' genius to be able to sit on the bench thinking about who was on that bench, what their skills were, and put them in the ball game at the right time. I think we had a team full of leaders, and also the people who were leading were also good followers. We relied on everybody, you know. We had a strong leader, so, you know, we felt comfortable in going to the games. The players that came off the bench were the players that fit the puzzle at that time, and it worked. If we couldn't have done that, we wouldn't have won the game at Colorado State on the last second. We wouldn't have beat Kansas. We wouldn't have had the experience with Cincinnati that we had. The thing that our ba this basketball team had, they had the ability to stop people defensively and they had uh, the ability to score points. Well, it didn't matter who you stuck in front of us, we were ready to play. I remember um, that year we were playing third-ranked Iowa. Uh, and I wasn't sure at that time how good we were, but that's the only time I saw that 66 bunch get motivated. We had them 32 to 4 at, uh, with about uh, 8 or 9 minutes left in the first half and then didn't play anymore. Everybody just went and rested. Uh, I felt that we were bulletproof and that we could never lose. As we went along, a lot of people pointed at us because we hadn't lost a ball game. And anytime you're undefeated, uh, you're going to get their best effort. Every game was important. Every game that we played, I mean, it wasn't, to be honest with you, it wasn't a lot of fun because every game was important. We couldn't lose. Good things happen when you keep winning. We knew that if we kept winning, that we, something good would happen. The year uh, was a great year, but a year that uh, I almost lost my sanity. These uh, players made sure that we almost had heart attacks quite often during the season. There were so many times that they came from behind and went into overtime and in fact even double overtime. You know, we, we're always behind. It seemed like we were always in a close game, uh, in games that we didn't need to be, uh, uh, they didn't need to be close. It's like, uh, it's like a great horse race, you know, they, sometimes a great horse is the secretary to race along uh, right together, right? in a bunch, and when it's time to win, they just win. When you walk between the lines, it's time to play. Nobody's supposed to be better than you. If you think any other way, you shouldn't play. I knew that we would go a long ways in the tournament. I didn't know whether we would go all the way or not. We knew what we had to do. We were very confident in each other. It was just a matter of time before something had to happen. It was a national championship game. I mean, that was a game that uh, Whatever team won it would stand up at the top of the pyramid and look down at all the other teams and say, okay, hey, we've got what you all started out to get at the beginning of the season, and this is fun. We went along in the tournament, and, and uh, the teams that looked like we were going to play, that was really even more interesting. Texas Western beat first Cincinnati and then Kansas in the regional tournament which were amazing victories. It wouldn't have been nearly as fascinating had we played Utah for the championship, or if we'd have played UCLA, teams that had already integrated for years. It was interesting that it was Duke and Kentucky. Everyone else thought that the, that the um, semifinal game was the real championship game. The Miners, as an independent, had to participate in a play-in game. So they actually had to win one more game than Kentucky did to get to the finals. Now. To some extent, some people thought Duke was their main rival, of course, but Texas Western was ranked number three. The Kentucky team had been ranked number one in the country for much of the year. The only thing that had been a question mark about them is they were a fairly short team. They were sometimes called Rupp's Runts because they were short. The fact that they had won using mostly five players, they didn't have much depth, and they also won without a, a tall center made them really a favorite team for Rupp and a lot of Kentucky fans. There was a lot of sympathy for them because they didn't have the superstars that some of the Kentucky teams had had. There was this tremendous mystique 
about uh, Kentucky. Uh, this was a particularly successful Kentucky team, so naturally they were fairly confident about all of their games, not just the ones against Texas Western. We were such a, a stepchild uh, uh, that we weren't <laughs> supposed to be on the same floor with them. They were saying that Pat Riley and Lou Adapter was better than anything or anyone on our team. It was just very difficult for basketball fans to think that this obscure school with this unknown young coach who had been a high school coach and a bus driver could possibly beat Kentucky. After all, they had as their coach Adolph Rupp who had won four NCAA championships and was arguably the most successful college coach in the United States at the time. Well, Adolph Rupp was the coach at Kentucky and had been the coach at Kentucky since the 1930s. Some people would argue he was the most influential person in the state of Kentucky, even more influential than the governor. I could have cared less about him. You know, it sound rude and blunt and to the point. Rupp was an elderly coach by the standards of the day. He had coached, you know, with white players all of his life. He, for whatever reason, began to acquire a reputation of not being interested in breaking the color line. Uh, that's what he was taught, so that, that's really all he knew. I was not playing against Coach Rupp. I was playing against Kentucky. Uh, I went into the game on an up note, and it was a personal reason, because that particular game I started. This game matches not only a team that has five black starters. And Kentucky's team was all white, and Adolph Rob made the statement to his players that no team of five blacks can beat us. I certainly thought that statement was ridiculous and a little bit uncalled for but he said it. I mean, we started five blacks anyway, nobody understood that. First of all, we were gonna play the, the, the five best players. They were trying to make a big deal of black and white, but Armstrong, you know, he's a white guy. If, if he hadn't played the uh, second half against Utah, we probably wouldn't have won. Careful observers saw this as a changing of the guard or a turning point in college basketball. What's going on? What we have here is a problem, but we can relate to the problem is winning the ball game. We were, had, a, had a chalk talk the afternoon of the game, and I look over, and we're in a little hotel room in College Park, Maryland, and I look over, and uh, uh, Hill's got a toothpick stuck in his teeth, about half asleep, and I look over, and Latin's, you know, kind of yawning and what have you, and, you know, we're p fixing to play for the national championship. When it got to the big game, you know, we felt pretty comfortable. Uh, that meeting ended up with me throwing an eraser against the wall. Go out there, play that tenacious style of defense. Get on the boards. And told them I hope they get their, you know what, kick. Play together and play hard. And we were going to be all right. When you start a ball game, you never know how it's going to go. The biggest surprise was that we started with three guards. The first play of the game turned the game around. David Lavin dunked on Pet Riley. First play, that's the one the strategy coach said. Uh, he said, Lumen, throw that wet, wet ball to the basket, and David, you just put the wet, wet ball into the basket. Latin uh, dominated the early part of that basketball game. We pretty well dominated uh, control, I'd say not dominated, but control the tempo of the game. The Utah players were so much quicker and faster, and they just surprised them, and he just ran away with the game. Oh, we did once in a while. You know, Bobby Joe stole the ball. And we did this or did that. Mad defense. I remember Bobby Joe's two steals because that's where it really turned. We were behind by one or something, and I took one and made a layup. The first thing I always think about are the, uh, the two steals by Bobby Joe. And then took another one, made a layup. Those two steals kept coming back to him. And that's, that was the only time we was ever behind, and then we were ahead by three then. And those back-to-back -back steals by Bobby Joe, I think, kind of broke uh, Kentucky's back. They, they couldn't get a shot off sometimes. I like my roommates dunk, though, that Daddy D, David Latin. I think we was dunking, it got their attention. Dunking, you know, dunking is a, can be an intimidating weapon. They were about six foot six, six seven, twenty fifty pounds. When he dunked, it was thunder. Yeah, he sort of dunked him in the basket. I did it quite often, as a matter of fact, during the game. 72-65 uh, the final score. And it was great. We went through the motions. I thought for, I didn't think we played uh, all out that game. I took the net. 
I put in my shirt, and I ran to the locker room. Winning a national championship takes tremendous dedication, tremendous work, ethics, but it also takes luck. And sometimes luck plays a lot, a lot in that. And fortunately, it all came together for us. It was nice that we won. It was good for the town. It was good. It was really good for college basketball. There are certain things that happen in history that maybe take 20 years to realize what an impact or what a significance it played in the, in the history of our country. As years have passed, the game did turn basketball around. As the big crowd files out of Cole Field House, Press Row works feverishly to make midnight deadlines. Their stories will tell of a small college in El Paso, Texas. The town was going nuts that night, I can tell you this, because from here we left in cars and caravans and went all the way around San Jacinto Plaza. I remember we circled the airport several times because there was thousands of people out on the runway. And, and we just kept making the, the circles till about one o'clock in the morning. And I came back, it was like four days later, but the whole place is still going berserk. There's fires at the center of campus. They had opened up uh, some of the fire hydrants. Uh, it wasn't fun for me. Uh, I hope they had a good time, I sure didn't. People were going all over town in cars, honking their cars downtown. We had no one El Paso had ever seen anything like it. Can you imagine? I don't think I have run across a single black sports fan, older black sports fan, or African-American professor who doesn't remember that game and doesn't remember the racial symbolism of it. I remember um, being on the playground and um, talking about the importance of the game. I think in the context of the 1960s, uh, the game was invaluable. Uh, the country was still in its infancy of you know, desegregation. People maybe have blown out of proportion the black-white situation, but it was a very significant ball game. I realized it, I mean, to be honest with you, because I came up in an environment where we were thought of as less than. You ask me if it was a racial issue, as far as I was concerned, I would say no. But they made it that way. Because it demonstrated on the basketball floor, in the arena, exactly what uh, civil rights activists and leaders and those concerned about American democracy were interested in. Those individuals were proselytizing and preaching for reform and change. And um, that game sort of illustrated uh, the messages that came from such powerful uh, men and women uh, to see it dramatized in the arena, in a basketball game, uh, I think uh, was one way of helping society advance and move forward to really come to grips with American democracy. You know, there wasn't a black player in the Southwest Conference, uh, Southeastern Conference. Hard to believe for many modern students that there ever was a time when every player in the Southeastern Conference was white. And I was thinking about winning and not who was black and who was white. We did start our five best athletes uh, and, and uh, no team had ever started five blacks in, in the final game. There was an attempt to um, undermine the nature of that victory by suggesting that um, the athletes were exploited, that Texas Western College may not have been playing by the rules. You know, he got him to the point where he'd said, I just assumed I lost that game and I wouldn't have to go through this. I remember Coach saying that at the time, you know. In fact, when we did a story about it, he said, you know, it would have been better if we came in second. Much of what was said uh, was merely a reflection of either the bias or the bigotry of the period. I think that what he was reacting to at the moment was all the hate mail he was getting. Big bags full, you know, of just, and, uh, is hate. Coach did a very good job in hiding it from us. Uh, I really didn't find out how much or uh, how many hate letters we received until we came back to get our ring. I knew everything that was happening here and, and had a real handle on, on the misery that he was going through and what responsibility he shared for what we all did in a way. You're exploiting this, you blah, 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 blah. I think it 
came out of venom, it came out of hatred, indeed it came out of segregationist attitudes. And the N-word was, was in there so many times that it's unbelievable. Those who frankly did not wish to see um, uh, American sports changed in such a way. You know, I, I'd tell Don, why are you reading it? These ugly letters that were coming to him and phone calls and this negative articles in uh, Sports Illustrated. You know, other coaches would take that Sports Illustrated article and, and put it in their pocket and, and take it to recruits. And they would say, well, look, you don't want to go to Utah. Look, look, look at this article. See, you don't want to go there. And then James Mishner's book. Uh, he calls it one of the most disgraceful chapters in American sports. Um, he called our players ragamuffins, street toughs. Uh, you have to realize, too, uh, the people in public had to sell magazines, they had to sell paper, and no one really wanted to read a lot of good stuff. It just doesn't sell paper. And I think what it took was a little time and processing for people to begin to understand the significance of that game. When you look back on it, you understand what Coach Haskins went through. Coach Haskins and Coach Iver put their careers on the line because if we hadn't have won, they probably wouldn't be coaching anymore. Essentially, we saw a noble coach, uh, very courageous ball players, and individuals who later went on to um, make something of themselves. So if any sporting event in, on the college level represents a turning point, it would be this 1966 NCAA basketball championship game between Texas Western and the University of Kentucky. Because the implications were momentous, it now meant that um, one could not abide by segregationist values or segregationist uh, attitudes. One had to think more fundamentally about integration and integrating uh, people of color into American universities at the athletic level. It was a valuable moment in American history. The, the wheels that began to turn, nothing was settled. Nothing was settled, but we, I think, opened opportunity for a lot of new kids to go to college. Not to play basketball, but to go to college. Unfortunately, I don't think that enough understand what we did. What he did on that night in Maryland opened up the doors for all these other black student athletes that otherwise would have never got uh, an education, a good education, and a good institution. I'm going to take a step further and open a lot of doors for a lot of black coaches. Texas Western is from a southern state, so this shows that even within parts of the South, some schools are recruiting African Americans. It doesn't mean that every southern school goes out and immediately starts recruiting African Americans. Bob McAdoo, uh, he was one of the leading scorers in the NBA. He said, hey Bobby, I don't thank y'all because North Carolina, the next year, North Carolina, SEC, they all started using black players before they wouldn't even use them. In fact, it's not until the 1972-73 school year that the last three teams in the Southeastern Conference finally have integrated football and basketball teams. It's been wonderful. It's been fantastic to be part of history and be part of the change and be part of the reverberation, especially at that time in America. Mm. Yeah, I'm part of history. I'm not George Washington, but I'm part of history, you know? You look at the span of the 10 years, five before that and five after that, through the Mexico Olympics. It's amazing the things that happened in this country. About three years after that time, I'm sitting looking at the <coughs> evening paper, the Herald Post, at that time, and I saw the all uh, the all conference team in the Southwest Conference, and I saw five, uh, five black guys, and that made me very happy. It took uh, several years before coaches grudgingly began to accept this. Uh, however, the trend was very clear from that game. We now have a black coach in Kentucky. 
But let me say this about, you know, <clears throat> I've got a lot of credit for that. The guy that deserves all the credit uh, was 1957. There was a, a black kid here by the name of Charlie Brown. Have you heard of him? We had a black athlete here, one Charlie Brown, who was played in varsity for us in the 50s. Charlie Brown was a great student and a great player. And who was named All Border Conference in the 50s. We'll just say, had he been a bad guy? Had he been a bad student? Had he offended the faculty at Texas Western? Uh, it probably wouldn't have been that easy. So, got to give George and, and Charlie all the credit. And so, it's a story of Texas Western College and its grandeur, and it's also a story of El Paso moving towards reform and change. El Paso uh, was able to arrive at that moment by supporting uh, the team and supporting the university. I'll always be grateful for the fans of El Paso who accepted us, who took us in, and every game that we played at Memorial Gym they were there. They were, they were the ones who motivated us. They were the ones who got our energies up because we could hear them out there when we were in our locker room. We could see them when we walked out onto the floor. I mean, it was just, the energy was there. There was no way anybody was gonna beat us. A lot of good things did happen to me in life because of, because of the game and the season that we had and the, the relationship that I had here in El Paso. I am um, tickled to be here. I'm blown away by the community and, and how graciously they invite us back. These are the guys that were used and, and you know tossed away. If so, they don't know it. Because they come back all the time. They love the community. The community loves them. A small town perched on the border could have such um, a momentous impact on the nation. The story uh, takes time to become what it really is. Now here they are, men, towards the end of their careers, you know, and you can see what kinds of, of people they've become. You know, one of the things that makes me the happiest is I can go right down the line and each and every one has, uh, has done well, and I've always said that uh, uh, like this group in here, you know, if you've got people that compete and they work hard and uh, they're dedicated, uh, they're probably going to be all right. How much fun it is to see everyone and see we're still standing and uh, share the old stories and share the new stories of family and, and friends. The extended family now after this many years is, is always fascinating to hear. Everybody has grandkids and they're all doing something. We're all active still. Some of us are beginning to retire, and uh, those conversations are interesting because it's a kind of a staggered retirement discussion, and everybody's talking about well, how is it, and, and uh, are you going to stay at it, and what do you do all day, and, and uh, it's just great. It's it's truly like having uh, uh, ten brothers.